Hi, everybody. Um, hopefully, I, I, uh, hopefully everyone is logging on. Is everyone ready to go? I'm, this is my first time hosting such a large uh, webinar, so I'm going to move forward as if everything is working well. And if it's not, if someone could get on the chat and let me know. Um, I'm gonna give a few minutes. I see lots of people logging in now. Um, I know what number we're looking for, so I'll just give everyone a few minutes to get settled. A um, Couple of housekeeping things before we get started, but like I said, I will let everyone sign in um, and we'll go from there. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you don't know about you, but here on the east coast of Newfoundland, it is a nice cold and rainy day. It's the perfect day to be thinking about getting back outside. And I apologize if you suddenly hear 16 uh, muddy boots coming through. I am at my office right now, and I anticipate that one or two drowned rats will come through any moment, but hopefully. Uh, they uh, respect the shared use space and if they don't well that's fine too because we are here to talk about getting kids outside and sometimes when you get kids outside and it's sideways raining you have to let them come in as well um, I'm just looking at the numbers they're still going up it's very exciting um, huge turnout today I'm really looking forward to how many people have joined us for this webinar it's really exciting to see uh, the, um, the enthusiasm. We are all starting to recognize how important it is to be outside, how important it is to be on the land. Um, Steph, if you're monitoring the chat, uh, there doesn't seem to be any video, only audio. Um, so I will throw that out to my technical team and hopefully we can get that sorted um, from the scenic end. Um, yeah, welcome everybody. Okay, still having some video challenges, technical team. Um, okay, some people can see me, some people can't. So I will make sure to um, keep myself presentable and <laughs> we'll go from there. Um, Zoom is a, a very interesting time for us outdoor educators. We're certainly not used to spending so much time in front of a computer screen and oh, I got my earrings in, I got my hair done for this. Like this is not really, <laughs> not really what I'm used to. So um, perfect. Hey, Tanya, welcome back. All right, um, in the conscious effort of time, um, I know the numbers are still going up, but I will start the process, uh, move it right along and hopefully we can, inform our practice together, we can move forward in these unprecedented times and um, help each other as we go through what hopefully becomes not only the new normal, but the better normal for kids and practitioners all over Canada, all over the world. Um, I will begin by saying my name is Laura Molyneux. I am a CNAC facilitator. Um, I've joined, I joined the team a long time ago um, and I'm also the program manager for Cloudberry Forest School, uh, which has been running since 2014. Um, we are a preschool, summer camp, homeschool enrichment program, um, and also pivoting a little bit in these unprecedented times um, and doing some other work as well. We are based out of lovely St. John's Newfoundland um, and home of the O'Brien Farm Foundation as well. So if you're interested in what we're doing, you're more than welcome to check it out and see how we've worked in our program. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the land that I practice on. The land is um, traditional homeland of the Innu, Inuit, and Mi'kmaq First Nations, as well as the home of the Beotuk, the Métis, um, and the Maritime Archaic Indians. Um, it's important when we work on the land that we remember the land as it was and where, um, where our role in that 
place-based education comes from. We also operate on traditional Irish farmland of uh, the Irish farm settlements of Newfoundland and Labrador, and it really presents an interesting space for us to practice as practitioners. Um, thank you everyone for coming. A uh, couple little housekeeping things. Uh, CNAC, hopefully you guys get something out of this. Hopefully we can build our community of practice from this. And we're really looking forward to sharing our knowledge, um, learning from each other, and also developing more um, resources and regular opportunities to connect with practitioners across Canada. Uh, so if there's um, something that you are interested in hearing more about, if someone mentioned something um, as a facilitator, then hopefully you can send us that feedback and we can develop these workshops for your interest. We don't want to be sending things out to the universe that aren't going to make a difference to anybody. So please, if you have an idea or a thought that you'd like to hear more about, please let us know. Um, we're also working on building relationships. If you have information that you'd like to share as well, uh, please reach out and we can help facilitate some of those conversations as well. Um, the webinar, I will introduce the panelists shortly. Um, and we will be allowing time for questions at the end. Um, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there should be, you'll see the participant list, then you'll see a Q&A button. We are asking that if you have a question that you'd really like attention drawn to it, that you submit it through the question and answer, the Q&A section, rather than the chat. The chat gets a little uh, muddly and sometimes uh, we don't always see the question as more and more people are chiming in. So if you could, if you have a question for one of the panelists, please put it in the Q&A section and we'll be monitoring that and then if you feel that you agree with the question or you see a question that you really want answered if you could sort of check that um, the more people that are interested in the same question the more likely it is that we'll have an opportunity to answer that and again that will be at the end so we'll allow all the panelists to speak and then we'll open up the floor to questions um, the record the webinar is being recorded so panelists you know, make sure your hair is right because this will become available um, to people on the CNAC website and we will be presenting a document in English and French. Unfortunately, my French was not strong enough to facilitate the conversation, but we'll be able to offer translation afterwards. Um, and that will also be available on our website. I do have to offer that this is for general information purposes. Um, please we are in unprecedented times please don't take this as gospel if you have any questions we're here to guide those conversations but we are practicing from very different regions all over the world i'm seeing someone just signed in from ohio so please make sure that you consult your own regional regulations your own public health and safety guidelines we can guide you in where to find that information but it is really important that you recognize that what I'm doing as a practitioner in an area where we have zero active COVID cases right now is a very different level than someone who might be practicing elsewhere. So just throwing that out there that we're here to help consult and guide the conversation, but um, not to necessarily give all the answers. Um, without further ado, um, I will introduce the panelists. Um, panelists, don't forget that you have eight minutes. I've got my timer set up, ready to go. Um, and so again, this is a guiding conversation. And we are going to start with the uh, practitioners who have opened. Um, some of them will have answers, some of them will have questions. Um, and so we'll open with the practitioners first. Hopefully this will help guide some of your own thoughts reflect on how you see programs opening or what some of the concerns you might have. And then we'll move into insurance and risk management from the legal side of things. Um, and I'm gonna introduce first to speak, Lara Purvis. Um, she is the lead educator at the Ottawa Forest and Nature School. She's a lovely human being. Um, and she is passionate about connecting 
Kids to the Great Outdoors as the leader of the Ottawa Forest and Nature School, which is a program of the Andrew Fleck Children's Services in Ottawa. She has a BA in Child Development, a B.Ed. and a MA in Global Development. She has worked and played alongside children in classrooms, community centers, parks, forests, and canoes. These experiences have led her to be committed to the value of play and the relationship between children in the land. She grew up in South Africa and loves to tell stories, sometimes made up and sometimes true. It's what I love about storytelling. And there's that gray area in between um, about snakes and mountains and how we get found, we get lost. Take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. So hi, everyone. I'm Laura, a lead educator at the Ottawa Forest and Nature School. Um, and grateful to be speaking to you from Ottawa on unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory. The Ottawa Forest and Nature School ran a seven week summer day camp program through July and August and we're about to step into our fall program. I'll share a bit about what prepared us for running program during the COVID-19 pandemic this past summer and some of our processes that we used to run a lower risk program. I have just eight minutes um, so I'm going to hustle. <laughs> um, and I just want to frame that, uh, that what I will be sharing is Ontario specific. Um, and based on the guidelines that were available to us in June through August, and um, some of which have shifted a little bit right now as we're stepping into September. So um, the Ottawa Forest and Nature School is a program of Andrew Fleck Children's Services. We were, the organization was founded by employees of CNAC and was a part of CNAC until July 2019, when we transitioned to Andrew Fleck Children's Services. Um, AFCS is a charitable multi-service early learning child care and family support organization with a commitment to centering outdoor play and learning in their programs. They were approved, AFCS uh, and Reflect Children's Services was approved to open emergency child care this um, past spring. And that was uh, a benefit to us. We were able to uh, take advantage of the experience gained there. So by the time the Ottawa Forest and Nature School was reopening, AFCS had a pandemic plan written and active for all of the licensed programs. So the Ottawa Forest and Nature School, I know many of you probably know it. It's not a licensed childcare program. It is a, it is a forest and nature school. Uh, however, the foundation was in place for us to run a program that felt safe for staff with many uh, protocols set up for um, possible COVID-19 scenarios. Uh, we also had the Ministry of Health's COVID-19 guidance for summer day camps. And that was um, together, those two documents provided us with lots of information, uh, like the number of children in a cohort and processes for lowering risk, such as sanitization of spaces um, and procedures for maintaining physical distance, management of screening, pick up and drop off possibilities. They, uh, those two documents provided us with requirements that we needed to meet for the summer and they were a helpful starting place. But a challenge, and I'm sure that many people will experience this, was that neither of those programs spoke directly to programs such as ours. Our um, program, like many uh, FNS type programs, the children are outside for most of the day. They arrive, they settle into play, they're called over for a circle. Um, and they gather maybe on stumps on logs under a tree to listen to a story and then they hike out onto the land and they spend the day out there. And how much time they spend within two meters of each other or physically distant depends on the group and it's really hard to know. I think it'd be very interesting research if anyone's ever interested to see how much time our children spend like within two, two meters of each other. Um, but already the program was a lower risk program and uh, to tease out the various parts of the day that may have been higher risk um, or at all concerning, we created a risk benefit assessment uh, for the day through a COVID-19 lens and went chronologically through the day, identifying when uh, we may be in higher touch, uh, high touch surface areas, when we, children might be uh, congregated, when families might be congregated, and went through that day chronologically uh, and discussed how we could mitigate that risk. So for instance, uh, when typically when parents dropped off children, they would arrive and they would hang up backpacks and they would chat close to the hooks as children settled in. Uh, changes that we made meant that uh, after screening, 
children were picked up and parents didn't actually step, walk down the, the trail and into any of the buildings that say their goodbyes out uh, on the trail after screening. Uh, and so children would also be settling in with their backpacks on a tarp outside instead of being inside. And I'll talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts and all the logistics and the ways that we did those pieces in a few minutes. But we created this risk benefit assessment for the day and that informed the design of our program. Um, the guidelines that were offered to us, I mentioned, they were a little bit challenging in that they didn't speak to all of, um, they didn't speak to our kinds of program. Uh, for instance, cushions, uh, we were, it, it, the guidelines said to, to not have cushions um, and to remove all of the soft fabrics from, from spaces. They were written for indoor programs, so we needed to think through something like burlap was the closest thing we had to cushions. It's hanging between trees or it's on the ground where children might sit and uh, and we had to think about what the intentions were in the experts advice so um, burlap children are sitting on it just like cushions uh, but far less frequently it's outside in fresh air and they're not putting their faces up against it we kept the burlap so we really needed to work through the advice given to us and try and interpret it for our our programs um, in terms of how we ran our day to day, uh, each staff person was screened on their arrival to work and they were screened in the same way their families were with five questions designed by Ottawa Public Health and a temperature check. Staff screened each other and uh, while after they'd done so in their setting up, a family started to arrive. We did a staggered start. And based on the guidelines this past summer, we had groups of eight children and two staff. While we could have had groups of eight children and one staff, having two staff meant that when a scenario came up where a child showed symptoms, it was easy for us to remove a child from program and uh, follow our, our protocol. So families arrived in a staggered start. They were screened in groups and they uh, that screening was much quicker than expected. Each group of, um, of eight children and their families screened in five to 10 minutes. And uh, it wasn't as complicated as we anticipated. It was easy to keep the cohorts well separated. We created a program where children in their groups were, um, two groups were out on the land, two groups were at the two shelters and they switched midday. And uh, a challenge for us was that when groups came across each other, um, it was tricky for them to maintain distance from each other because our trails have poison ivy along the sides of the trails. So for instance, staff had to communicate with each other to ensure that we knew who was on the trail and when they were off the trail that another group could head down the trail. Um, small little peculiarities like that were a part of running um, first a forest school program this summer. Uh, when a uh, family reported symptoms during screening, they were asked to either uh, have that person tested or to be symptom free for 24 hours, uh, 48 hours in the case of gastro symptoms. And these guidelines were provided to us um, through both our pandemic plan and through the Ministry of Health's guidelines. We also, anytime there was an ambiguous situation or uncertainty, we were able to make a quick call to Ottawa Public Health and Ottawa Public Health was really responsive and clear in their guidance for us. They offered us practical steps on what to do anytime something seemed a little unclear. Each cohort also had a kit um, of loose parts, which meant that we had less possibility of transmission through sharing. And uh, that kit included clipboards, art supplies, ropes, swings, clay, paint, and books. And um, anything that was non-porous would, uh, would be sprayed, and many of the porous items too, would be sprayed at the end of the day um, with, sanitize, well, with a sanitizing disinfectant. Um, the day included frequent hand washing and sanitization of any shared spaces before a group transitioned out from their space and a new, new group transitioned in. We also took the logs out of our circles and replaced them with well-spaced stumps and asked parents to label their items even more clearly than ever before, because obviously that's a <laughs> frequent request. And this time it was a very loud and clear request. 
um, in order to ensure that our groups uh, were self-sufficient and did not need to step into shared spaces because they had forgotten something or they needed to run back to a bathroom, each group also carried out a luggable loo with them. And that meant that they were out on the land, they had everything that they needed. And uh, luggable loo is just a little portable toilet in a bucket. And the staff just carried it out like they carried their backpack, no big deal, hid it behind a tree. And uh, then bathroom, bathrooming was taken care of. Pick up at the end of the day was also in staggered cohorts. And, uh, and uh, that was, I'm trying to see, is there anything that I missed? I mean, there's probably other bits and pieces that was a part of how we ran a safer program, but that's how we, um, how we went through our day. In, in summary, summary, pretty much we relied on our screening processes to lower COVID-19 risk for children and staff so that we could continue to run the kind of program that we love and cherish, a program that was able to center relationships and care and connection on the land. And I do, I feel like we were able to do that. Um, we, it wasn't possible for us to run a program that was um, risk-free. We made informed and thoughtful decisions with the information that we had, and we were well supported and resourced when we had uncertainties. I, uh, I feel like for folks who are stepping into program for the first time this fall um, and who are maybe feeling listening and they're listening and they're, they're anxious and uncertain, um, I want to just share that we weren't always feeling certain and uh, like we knew exactly how to manage every step. There were times that we were second guessing ourselves, there were times that we were nervous. And at the end of the summer, we um, we heard so many comments from families and from staff about feeling safe and feeling relieved and feeling grateful to be back on the land. And, uh, and a lot of families sharing that it was such a rich and restorative experience for the children after being at home for so many months. So That's there you go. <laughs> That's certainly something that we found too, is, is the healing power that coming from the forest. So thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom. Um, and it's also interesting to see how, even without consulting with Ottawa Forest and Nature School, a lot of the things that we've been doing line up um, because the best place to be is outside. Um, I'm going to introduce now Monica Miller. Monica is a mom of two nature explorers, ages four and a half and 22 months. She is an avid hiker and camper, little bit of an eco nut at times, and the founder and lead educator of Kingston Forest in Nature School. She grew up on a horse farm in Southern Ontario and spends endless hours outdoors, hiking, camping, playing, exploring, building, tending to animals and more. Nature is very much a part of who she does or who she is <laughs> and how she lives her life. <laughs> Whoops. She recognizes the value of time spent in nature and sees the benefit in herself, her own children, and the children and adults that she works with. Passionate about education in the outdoors, she knew she was going to start a forest and nature school as soon as she knew they existed. I think we'd be kindred spirits, Monica. Um, it took a few years of working in a classroom setting, yep, and then pursuing her passion for the outdoors in her spare time and on maternity leave before it all came together. She started Kingston Forest and Nature School last fall with a ton of community support and then had served the wider Kingston community with weekly programming for two to 12 year olds and drop in events for all ages. So you have the floor now, Monica. All right, thank you. Um, and since everyone else gave a lovely weather report and where they're coming from, um, it is a gorgeous, feels like fall day here in Kingston, Ontario, uh, like I think 15 degrees and sunny. Um, and I'm coming from the unceded territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. Um, so just wanted to um, acknowledge that as well. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I founded Kingston Forest and Nature School last fall. Um, so all of this happened in my first year of programming, uh, which has been uh, challenging beyond what I signed up for. <laughs> but I guess 2020 has been more than anybody signed up for. Um, so we um, we run two different programs at Kingston Forest and Nature School. We have our seedlings program, which is for, um, was for four to 10 year olds and we're, the program is kind of growing with the kids and we're now open four to 12 year olds. Um, so school age, kids are dropped off for the day, 8.30 to 3.30. 
Um, and we run that like weekly, but right now coming up into the fall, we're offering it three days a week. So you can come Monday, Wednesday, Friday, just Mondays, just Wednesdays, just Fridays, like everybody can sign up kind of their own way. And then we also have our Acorns and Oaks program, which is our parent assisted for two to five year olds. So we have, um, yeah, anybody in, within the age of two to five, um, younger siblings can attend, can tag along, parents, grandparents, babysitters, whoever wants to bring um, the kids, brings the kids. Um, and both of those programs are looking a little bit different this fall than they have in the past, but we also only ran them each one day a week in the past. And we're now looking at three days of seedlings and two days of acorns and oaks, both of them at full capacity this fall. So the challenges of a growing program along with looking at COVID policies. We did run our seedlings program for the month of July. Um, so we closed down mid-March, reopened beginning of July, um, using a lot of the same guidelines that Lara was talking about. Um, the Ministry of Health put out the summer camp guidelines. We were working with guidelines from our own um, public health unit. Um, and I did have the support of Langley Forest Below in BC sent me their um, COVID policies and procedures and memorandum of understanding that they had families sign. Uh, which was really nice to have that to, to start from and work from because I mean, how does anybody, how does anybody start one of these documents? I mean, like it's, I don't even know, there are so many things to consider. Um, before we opened, we had several parents reaching out to us specifically requesting that the children feel these safety um, procedures and policies and measures as little as possible. Um, that was very, very important to a lot of the families that were registering and some made it very clear that they were not interested if we were masking, enforcing physical distancing at all times, um, and just essentially having it feel like what they would go through anywhere else, um, knowing that being outdoors is lower risk, the smaller numbers are lower risk. Um, we're in a low risk area. Um, Kingston has had one small outbreak, but I think we're still around 100 cases since the beginning um, in our entire health unit area. So all of those things considered, um, we did feel that it was safe to run. Um, we only ever had 15 participants and three facilitators on site at a time this summer. And we're looking at um, 16 and three facilitators for the fall. Um, things, that, like, things that we worked really hard on were the hand hygiene piece and disinfecting. Uh, as well as just maintaining space between people, but really focusing more on no physical contact. Uh, so we did have some siblings attending together and some friends in the same social circles where um, we had written consent from parents that physical contact um, was okay with them. We changed our hammock rules. We usually have a, a limit of two kids per hammock. We made it uh, a limit of one per hammock unless you're in the same, same family or same social circle. But otherwise it was just um, like screening at the beginning of every day and we chose to do our screening online. So we had families complete um, a Google form before arriving, sometimes in the parking lot. And, uh, and then we just trickled in. We didn't have a staggered start time, but we have a 500 meter walk in from our parking lot. So it worked out really well that sort of as five kids arrived, they headed in with the first facilitator. As five more kids arrived, they headed in with the next facilitator. So we kind of had our own little trickle in, everybody washed hands when they arrived. Um, we tried to spread out as much as possible, avoided the use of our indoor space. Uh, we have a yurt on site and we tried to make it like, you know, one person in grabbing something, get back out if you needed to be in there at all. And um, we had timers set on our phones um, throughout the day that like, I mean, obviously before and after eating, before and after the bathroom, there was hand washing, but we also had like a sort of every two hours-ish an alarm would go off and all the kids would be like, Sanitized. They were so drilled into that routine. Um, I'm not sure. I've been looking through some of the questions that people have been asking just to kind of address. We didn't have a mask policy um, and we have a mandatory mask order in Kingston um, due to a recent outbreak. Um, but we are exempt um, based on the descriptions of the businesses that are exempt and we ask that Families pack a mask if they wanted to, and there were two times we had to seek shelter in the yurt during a thunderstorm. Uh, and it was just sort of like, if the children felt more comfortable wearing a mask, they could put a mask on during that time, but that it was not mandatory for us and will continue to not be mandatory for us going into the fall. But that's based on our current guidelines here in Kingston. Um, 
And then, yeah, like just disinfecting common touch areas in and around the bathroom and hand washing station and that sort of thing. We didn't have anybody have any symptoms the entire summer, so that was helpful. I know going into the fall, that's going to look a little different with uh, kids. Some, some of the kids that we have um, in our programs are going to be in the traditional school setting the other um, two, three, four days a week that they aren't with us, so that will change things. Um, but all of the kids on Monday will be the same kids every Monday. All of the kids on Wednesday will be the same kids every Wednesday. Um, same with Friday. And then with our Tuesday, Thursday groups, um, with the Acorns and Oaks being the younger kids, uh, two to five year olds, we did look at not running programming at all for them, um, just with the like constant putting of things in mouths and the excessive amount of touching and lack of hygiene with that age group. Um, but we, after Ontario around July 17th, um, raised the gathering limit to 100 outside with physical distancing. So we felt safe doing that. Um, so we'll have 12 families on site. We're going to have, everybody's going to have their own separate, we're calling them curiosity kits, like a backpack with a magnifying glass, um, bug jar, tweezers, flashlight, binoculars, different things like that, that everybody will have their own set of and just we'll have less sharing that way. But I don't, I don't know if I have anything else specific to share about our experience this summer, but everything went, went really well for us and the kids seemed to fall into the routines and we just tried to keep them as, as sort of untrusive daily routines and, and less of a scary mandatory get your germs away from each other kind of thing. I love the name Curiosity Kits. We do the same thing. We call them bubble bags. Same thing, a little bag with the, the, the things you'll need to go out and adventure on your own. So thank you so much for sharing, Monica. Um, next, I'm going to introduce Jacqueline Bennett. Jacqueline is passionate about the outdoors. She spent most of her childhood in the wilderness of British Columbia and has been returning to nature recreationally in her life. She is an avid hiker, yogi, and has a hardworking and enthusiastic personality. She was born in Calgary, Alberta, but has strong family roots in Newfoundland and Saskatchewan. She is an Aboriginal person, although she has a connection with her European heritage in Newfoundland. In 2018, Jacqueline founded Sapling Forest School. This seasonal program brings children ages three to nine into the forest to learn, play, and grow. She's a graduate from the College of the North Atlantic in Cornerbrook with a diploma in early childhood education. Her training is focused on the importance, development, and practice of developmentally appropriate emergent curriculum for children ages zero to 12. She holds a level two certification in ECE as well as a level two family child care certification. She is also certified as a Forest School Practitioner by Forest, uh, Forest School Canada and additionally has certified as an Adult and Children's Yoga Instructor by Namaste Studios. Other certifications include Wilderness and Remote First Aid and in training, uh, sorry, and in training children. She has experience working with children of all ages in a variety of settings that include center-based care, after-school programs, summer camps, and private home settings. Jacqueline is also a fourth year psychology major at Grenfell Campus. And after graduation, she hopes to grow a sapling for a school into a company which has a supportive, positive impact on well-being, health, and growth of all who wish to reconnect with nature. And I speak from personal experience. My little nephew did saplings this year. Um, and I just met, uh, met up with him yesterday and he raved about Jacqueline's program. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you, Jacqueline, on what you did to keep Nixon safe this summer. Hi, everybody. Thanks for that introduction, Laura. Um, you covered all of my bases. <laughs> That's my pretty good portfolio there. Um, I am super excited to be here. Um, I, as Laura said, I did run a successful program this summer. Um, our program uh, is a seasonal program right now. Um, Laura mentioned that I'm a student. I can't be in two places at once. So I, we run a forest school in the summer months um, and uh, we take breaks uh, through the fall and the winter. Um, in preparing for camp this year, um, we, I was really concerned that we weren't going to operate at all. I thought that the best, um, uh, I thought that the best course of action was to keep everybody safe and to remain on lockdown. 
Um, I live on the west coast of Newfoundland um, in what's known now as the Atlantic bubble. Uh, so we are very fortunate to have no cases, uh, no new cases reported in the last two weeks. And the cases that we have been um, that have been reported over the last say three months or so have been travel related and isolated. So we have no community transmission. Uh, we are um, <clears throat> very uh, fortunate uh, to be in this uh, public situation. However, um, I did set up a number of policies and procedures to go forward um, should an outbreak happen. So I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, I'll give you the good news first though. So our program um, has really been a relief uh, for so many families has really provided a space for families to relax to drop their shoulders a little bit the children are used to um, being screened so we screen our provincial situation has allowed us to screen weekly and we check in daily so our official screening um, the parents come in on Monday, they're aware that the questions they have to fill out. Um, we had one child who displayed symptoms um, of a headache um, throughout the camp. Uh, it wasn't anything to cause alarm. Again, we had no cases in Newfoundland. Um, and we informed her parents and she stayed home for the afternoon. Um, so that's the extent of our um, COVID experience so far. Um, once again, I'm super grateful for that. Um, and um, in preparing for the COVID situation, um, we were given a summer camp guidelines. So like other facilitators mentioned, um, the public health authority did release uh, some guidelines, none of which were forest or nature school specific. Um, so I um, adjusted those guidelines to fit into um, what worked for our program and um, based on the provincial situation, um, it worked out well. Um, the biggest thing that I can offer to anybody who's running a forest and nature school is to connect with us or to connect with other people in your area. Um, that was my saving grace <laughs> and not for the program for my mental health. <laughs> so our uh, program um, as, as facilitators, we are under um, not only a high risk situation, but we also hold a lot of responsibility to keep everybody safe. Um, so it's important that we network. It's important that we chat. Um, I was able to reach out to uh, Cloudberry Forest School in St. John's and they were wonderful in explaining what their policies and procedures were. Once again, we're all kind of writing this book together. <laughs> we're all kind of sailing together. Um, and in a place where I am the only forest and nature school within an eight hour drive, um, it was super important for me to reach out and I'm really glad that I did. Um, so I want to talk about like we do have um, policies and procedures if cases were to increase um, or if um, the level of risk in our province was to increase. But what ended up happening uh, where we were super low cases is um, we were able to be a little bit flexible on social distancing. Um, each, when we started, we had small groups. We had uh, one facilitator per, per group. A lot like what Laura had mentioned in her explanation is that we were focusing on keeping one facilitator per a small group. Our initial guideline was that we were allowed to have one facilitator per 10 children. Um, and anybody that works with children would know that two is much better. Two, two facilitators for 10 children. Um, we did even better. Uh, we did one for six, so two to 12. Um, and that was a ratio that I felt comfortable with. Even uh, COVID or no COVID, that's where I feel um, safe with our numbers. Um, and so the groups did mingle. The groups mixed. Um, the groups were able to um, play in a way that was, I'll say the children were unaware of COVID had even happened. And that's why I'm saying that uh, we were to be able to be a relief for parents and a relief for kids. Our children were stuck indoors since March, and this is the first time that they were able to get out and connect socially, reconnect with nature. Uh, we are sanitizing our 
mud kitchen materials um, in between uh, each use, so daily, um, just as a, as a good precaution. We rinse them off anyway, but I've just added a sanitizer to that uh, situation. Um, the bathrooms are sanitized daily or twice daily. Again, not a huge reach for us. Uh, Newfoundland and Labrador uh, recently regulated that uh, we are required to wear masks in public places. Um, so we don't have an indoor public space. Um, I do have an office that I work out of. Um, and that staff use breaks for and that kind of thing. Um, but we've had one family in there at a time. So one family can go in and drop off their stuff and go on outside. And so the, um, all the parents are aware that it's a fully uh, outdoor program and um, there's no expectations for any masks. And it's been um, a wonderful experience uh, to be able to do that, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna go... I don't know how much time I have left. I don't know how long I've been talking. Thanks, Laura. Um, and I'm just kind of running through these questions. I'm not sure that I, a lot of these have been answered. Um, yeah, so we did use a paper a screener that is documented um, all the time, or sorry, weekly, um, and, it's, and it's saved there. Um, Depending on your um, situation, uh, depending on your local situation, I really feel that if, uh, as, a, as a forest and nature school facilitator, you will absolutely not only be supporting the immuno, um, the immune systems of the children in your care, but you'll be relaxing the um, stress of parents that they're able to play in a safe environment. And I would really encourage you to reach out to me, uh, to connect with me. We can talk more details about what happened during COVID um, so that Forest and Nature School can continue to happen in a safe way um, because I think our programs will benefit um, families in in these unprecedented times and I'm so grateful that everybody here is in that field and working in that way so thank you very much. Sorry I wasn't expecting you to be done so soon so I had to take a minute to no that's great thank you so much for sharing um, it's been a real pleasure again I, I'm slightly biased but it's been a pleasure working with you this spring on collaborating and, and brainstorming some of the, the things that we need to do to ensure that everyone, um, children and also families are feeling safe and that we can move forward and we can show and demonstrate that outside is the best place. It's the absolute safest place for us to be right now. And we need to back that up with policy. And we also need to back that up with insurance. So um, I'm going to introduce the uh, the next panelist is Tracy uh, Esso, Esso. Um, and Tracy is a risk uh, assessment and solutions manager in the risk management department with at Frank Cowan Company with expertise in insurance claims, risk management, and captive insurance. She has been in the insurance industry for over 20 years. Uh, she has created risk management and claim solutions for a myriad of clients and continues to champion the beliefs that the best risk management practices can be determined by closely examining past claims experiences. Tracy is passionate about delivering unique customer service solutions within the risk management and risk transfer space. Tracy has a bachelor's degree in fine arts and obtained her chartered insurance professional designation in 2011 followed by a, risk, a CRM risk management certification and has most recently achieved her associateship in captive insurance from the ICCIE. Tracy is an instructor for the Insurance Institute of Canada teaching future insurance professionals in the industry. She has spoken at several conferences on topics ranging from insurance fraud to liability claims. Key accountabilities at Frank Cowan Company include assessing the risk management requirement of our clients developing and executing risk management, risk management plans for future and current, current clients, and preparing and presenting educational seminars on a variety of risk issues. So I'm sure, Tracy, there will be a lot of questions for you this afternoon. Well, I think Mike will take them all, don't worry. <laughs> I'm just gonna pass it over to Mike. Uh, thank you very much, Laura, for that. I appreciate it. Uh, makes me feel very, very old. Um, and boring compared, and none of the classes that I teach are in the forest, and they should be, 
insurance in a forest environment. That would be fun, wouldn't it, Mike? Did you think, um, yeah, I think people could get their CIP in, in a forest situation. That would be pretty cool. Um, I'm really glad that we changed the, um, the process around so that the facilitators or the practitioners went first so that to, to Aaron's point so that you could kind of see what's what's going on and frankly Lara you basically went over everything so I'm good if you want to just move on <laughs> you sound like you guys um, really work well together even though you're a disparate in disparate locations you certainly work well together as a team and that's that's a fascinating or a fabulous thing to see um, and thank you very much for inviting uh, me today too. I, I really appreciate it. Um, a few things to just go over is um, the, as, as we've pointed out already, we all know this is a really dynamic situation. It's, it's going to be very different if you're in, you know, Gross Morn or outside of Gross Morn Park versus someplace in British Columbia, it's going to be a, a very um, different, and it should be. Um, it, it should be responsive. Your protocols and your and your programs should be responsive um, to the areas that you're in. So, Jacqueline, to your point, if you're in the Atlantic bubble and you've got nothing, you know, there's there's no community spread, then clearly your your guard can come down, and that's the right thing to do. Um, if you're in a place like British Columbia right now, you know, it's it's kind of getting a little scary, especially with, with community spread right now. And and uh, uh, we just canceled, supposed to be on holidays this week, but I canceled my trip because I did not want to go to British Columbia or um, Alberta. I'm in risk management, so I'm a little bit more hyper-focused on that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't think I'm going to take up my full time, or I always say that at the very beginning, and then I start going. But the one th the things that I would, would kind of recommend is, and Frank Cowan is here to, to partner with you and to, to help you with this, is um, all of you have great processes in place, uh, it sounds like, and, and they're, again, responsive to your areas. What I would say is I would want to see documentation for that. So, Laura, you have, you know, the, the sanitary, or Jacqueline, you were saying the sanitization and, and, and all of that. I would, what we're recommending to people, because you can imagine we've get lots of requests you know in the past few months we've we've received a lot of requests as to what best practice is um and and to your point you stick with what the public health region is telling you to do um, i like that you've actually spoken to your and, and utilized your public health authorities make sure you're documenting those calls preferably in an email um, and i'm sure aaron can comment on this more because he's going to go into the more legal aspect of it but at the end of the day, what we want to see in risk management is, first of all, nobody ever gets sick, and that would be a wonderful um, thing. Uh, and then secondly, if somebody does get sick, that you have a protocol in place to say, okay, we're going to, to shut it down. Jacqueline, I think you talked about that when, you, you know, when there was a, a girl that had a headache. You had a procedure in place. So it's great that you have a procedure in place. I would want to see it written down. Um, I would want to see that the parents sign on to that protocol ahead of time. This is what we're going to do in the event of A, B, and C, and have it very much laid out. It's also really important, I think, Monica, you were saying that masks really aren't something that 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 your group or necessarily want to ascribe to at this point, or or and you feel and, and what you would want to do is you would want to have everybody sign on to that as a parent. To recognize this is going to be a no mask situation you got to be okay with that because what we wouldn't want to see is little bobby or susie going to school and then their parents going well what do you mean she's she's sick now what do you mean you weren't using masks having said that again we also have to make sure that we're adhering to public health guidelines if you're saying when you're inside you have to wear masks then you have to show that you're adhering to those rules in a best practice sense um, and, and that might not always be feasible. Um, I would argue that, you know, you people are leaders for young children. And I know that, that right now in Ontario, I have several friends that are teachers and they're all saying, there's no way these kids are gonna wear masks in schools. And it's a very, as we all know, contentious political issue about wearing masks. And what I would say is more and more, like at the onset, I remember my husband's in insurance as well, and we were having this discussion about whether insurance adjusters should be wearing masks when they go out to a claim, for instance. And I remember saying, yes, absolutely, they should, because you want to protect other people. Um, this was at the very onset, like mid-March, when they were saying um, that, 
there weren't enough masks around. We're not even sure people should be wearing them. And now here we are where everybody should wear a mask. Everybody and their uncle should wear a mask. I think the science right now is saying that it not only protects the other people, which is what we thought we were doing, but it also does offer some protection to the person wearing a mask. And so, and the science is constantly changing. We're finding out more about the way this particular virus works. I just think that um, encouraging mask use is, is something that as um, educators to children, get them comfortable with it because there's a good chance we're gonna be wearing them for the next couple of years. Um, and again, as long as, but if you've got a group of parents that are saying, well, I don't want my kid to wear a mask and you don't, and they're outside and they're, they're very well spaced and they're not ill, then there's no reason to. And again, as long as you're adhering to those public health guidelines, because you want to be able to show if someone gets ill, these were the guidelines, we adhered to them, here's the evidence that we adhered to them. Um, and all of the parents knew that this was the protocol that we were that, that we were adhering to. So that's a, an important consideration. I, I would like to see if in a perfect world, and I don't know how much um, CNAC does this, but like Laura, it sounds like you and Jacqueline had a really good um, back and forth. And Laura, you've offered assistance to other practitioners. In a perfect world, you would want to see kind of this overarching protocol that can trickle down to the practitioners so that you have a, a bible so to speak of these are the best practices and then they can be tailored for sorry i talk my hands a lot um they can be tailored for the areas in which you live and 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 whether you're in the atlantic bubble where there aren't any cases or whether you're in bc you can tailor that but ideally as far as risk management you would want to see some sort of this is what we do and then that if you're sitting in front of a judge you can say because this is what we do this is our protocol we always do this this is what we do um, and have documentation and have it um, retained either electronically preferably um, we're use uh, we have uh, samples we can show you as to how to do an electronic waiver those are very effective can be very effective if they're treated properly um, to recognize that in the event of an outbreak, um, CDNAC or your particular field school isn't going to be, or for school isn't going to be, uh, I mean, you're always going to, you can always get sued, but that you would have a defense in place. So those are some of the things just from, from what you've mentioned. I mean, it just sounds like you're doing a fantastic job and, and goodness knows being outside has been a, a well, it's been a really important thing for me just to go out and walk the dog has been a, a quite an outing because I feel like I've been inside since March 13th and I haven't been out. So um, the other thing that we talked about or that we've talked about with other clients has been um, the idea of um, sanitizing. And I know at one point um, there was uh, hand washing every 15 minutes, which is absurd. <laughs> But again, those those things will change with with public health. Um, you know, not using gloves because they and kids won't anyway. But certainly, um, your uh, your facilitators not to wear gloves because they're pretty useless, and really washing hands is more important. Um, not to leave the children alone with the hand sanitizer is another one. Um, we're starting to hear some spooky stories coming out of the United States about that, and and that's just. Um, freaky, but it can happen. Um, and making sure that, because um, we also want to keep your facilitators safe, and they're going to be older, presumably, than the children. We, you know, like we're, we think that right now with the virus that the that children won't have any long term effects if they get ill, or if they're, they're, um, if they're contagious, even that they won't have long term effects. But frankly, we don't know. Um, again, I'll let Aaron, the lawyer, speak to that because um, th those, those, whenever we're dealing with minors, it's always that extra caution of, of we have to be hyper careful. Oh, and the other thing is, don't throw away your records. You want to retain those records for a really long period of time. Um, uh, the ability to sue when minors are involved um, takes the statute of, statute of limitations um, to new heights, and so you have to be very cognizant that you're holding on to uh, those records. You want to um, keep them in a very safe place because now you have a cyber exposure because you now have personal uh, information on a computer that 
and right now we're we're experiencing well you've seen the CRA hacks there is there's been huge cyber um, exposure during this because I guess hackers have got nothing better to do but sit around and be on their computer and come up with new ways to break into yours. Um, Zoom what else are we doing? It's 2020. Yeah, that's oh, right. yeah. what, what, what more can happen? They're probably trying to hack into the CRA, right? <laughs> I, know, I know. It's kind of, um, I don't know where the expression comes, but, but what fresh hell is this? It's like there's always something <laughs> new to, to be concerned I know. about. I know I I we are at our eight minutes so I hate to cut you off. Oh well, um, see, I told you I would do yep. it. <laughs> um, so uh, especially since you leave us with the scary suing part, so hopefully Michael, you can uh, continue down that road so that we don't all panic that we're all getting sued now because I was be really <laughs> I was really enthusiastic. I was like, oh no, we're doing good. Like I'm feeling really solid about my programming, and now Tracy's telling me I'm getting sued. So I'm going to move on to Michael, who's going to reassure me that I'm not with his 26 years of experience experience in the insurance industry, Michael has progressed throughout his career into his current role as vice president. Michael's focus is to develop relationships with specialized brokers across Canada and create new opportunities with specialty <coughs> organizations and targeted associations. Michael and his team of experts specialize in creating new and unique solutions for brokers and clients by providing the best risk solutions available. This enables Frank Cow and Company to continue to be an innovator and pioneer in the insurance industry. Michael is a University of Toronto graduate and has obtained his FBIP and CRM designations. Michael is a licensed broker in every Canadian province, so you got to come to Newfoundland next and territory with the exception of Quebec. Thanks for the great intro, Laura, and I love it over in Newfoundland. I've spent some time on both coasts there. It's a beautiful place. Um, and talking about the weather report over here, it's kind of gray. Um, it's supposed to be warming up a little bit as I look outside the window, it looks like it might be. But when I was out a little earlier today, it was certainly chilly. It's unfortunate, but the end of summer is coming. I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to try and uh, be reasonably brief. Um, I may not be able to uh, make you feel less scared about being sued, but I can give you some reassurance that if you are sued and you have an insurance policy for liability, that there will be coverage in most regards. Um, I'm familiar with Frank Cowan's offerings, so that will be my focus of my conversation and any questions that are asked of me today. And please feel free to ask any questions that you want. Um, I'm happy to go chat with them. Um, I just wanted to underline what you've already heard and I suspect may hear again. It's all about documentation and records. It's what you can prove that you did do. It's what you can prove in the court. Um, I thought I'd start off with a quick little bit about claims and then move into a bit about the policy and the underwriting. For claims, each one is its own unique story and kind of follows its own unique path. So I can only speak generally. Generally speaking, business interruption is only triggered when there's a physical loss to your premises. So most policies issued in Canada would not include COVID. For liability, COVID will be covered per se based on your negligence. And negligence is when you are, it's suggested that you haven't done something that you should have done or did something that you should not have done. Uh, there are no exclusions in our current policies that are out there for pandemics, epidemics or communicable diseases that I'm aware of. Um, but I am aware that there are companies that do have those. So I would suggest that you chat with your broker about that. For COVID-19, there have been temporary changes to ours and well, pretty much everyone else's underwriting guidelines. And so I would recommend if you're looking for insurance that you set yourself up for this early on in the process. Give yourself as much time as you can. Most insurance companies are looking for controls to prove that you weren't negligent, some documentation so that they can defend you in the court. And by following the guidelines that the CNAC has put together with um, um, and Laura, correct me if I get the, the wrong, is it called the BRAT, Risk Assessment Template? If you follow those guidelines though, that will certainly help you um, as you go through your insurance experience. You wanna tell the full story. I can't tell you how many times I chat with practitioners and they tell me about some of their insurance problems. And when you get down to it, it's because they've asked um, an insurance company, hey, it's Wednesday on Friday night, I'm going over to, uh, uh, Algonquin Park in Ontario or uh, 
we're um, Okanagan Lake and BC and I'm taking along six kids and I need insurance. That's not a good time to get your insurance. The best time to get your insurance is we have lots of time and that you can work through the details. I would suggest putting together a full package explaining all the things that I've heard on this phone call. All the wonderful risk management things that each of these three practitioners are doing are things that will make it so that you get your insurance in a really easy manner. And then you want to look for uh, the appropriate coverage as well. In addition for uh, abuse liability, uh, you're also going to want to have your regular liability for slips and falls. I would suggest directors and officers liability to protect those who are also volunteering to help out and who are putting their personal assets on the line. There's likely some property um, insurance that you might want to look at too. Um, and before this, I'm, I'm looking at the time too. Um, if I might, I asked our underwriting department, what are some uh, brief questions and answers? And one of the first questions I get from the, uh, from the practitioners is what are the deal breakers? What makes it tough to insure um, one of these four schools? And essentially it's not telling the full story. You want to ensure that your plans and policies and procedures are included with the application. Let them know that you've got a plan, that you've got things thought out and that you're making this happen. For COVID-19, are there any specific questions? And again, it's just what we've heard today, the sanitation procedures and the other process that everyone's going through to make it as safe as possible. Um, I also have heard are new ventures uh, automatically declined by insurance companies? Because apparently that is an issue elsewhere. And the truth is, I don't see a lot of true new ventures. I see a lot where people have experience doing something else. They work for a different forest school or they work for an educational facility. And again, it's a matter of telling that story. That's not like a, a guy like me who's used to sitting behind a desk so he decided I'm gonna run a forest school on Friday and take kids out onto Lake Okanagan. It's all the time and effort and skill set that you bring to the equation. Um, and so I guess in summary, uh, the more information that you bring to an insurance company, the easier it is to make things work out well for you. Thank you, Michael. I, I feel like I have to disclose everything on this uh, panel. So we are actually insured by Frank Cohen as well. And I have to say, if you don't provide it, they will ask for it and they will make you <laughs> make you sp spend, I spent two days writing a, a child abuse policy um, <laughs> to make sure that everything was hunky-dory. So uh, you've got some great, uh, great uh, people on your team as well that get me, uh, get me working. <laughs> um, to make sure that uh, everything is good from a programming end as well as from a liability end. So um, if anyone is looking for insurance, this is not a pitch, um, but we've worked with a few insurers and um, they've been really understanding of for school and what it is that we do. Um, and so one last panel before I introduce the last panelist um, in the recognition of the time we have remaining, we will be extending the Q&A. Um, for those of you that can stay, I recognize that people might be in the middle of their workday and they might need to leave, um, but we will be adding a few minutes of extra time for Q&A. Um, hopefully the panelists can stay on and help us with that as well. And as well, the, there will be a document produced from the Q&A and from the chat so that if you do have to step out and you had a burning question, that hopefully we'll be able to answer that in an email or a PDF document after that. So I would like to introduce our final panelist, best for last, right? Um, we have Aaron Bookman, who is a partner at Carfra Lawton LLP. Uh, he is a father of four girls and enjoys sharing his love of backpacking, kayaking, hiking, and swimming with them. When he's not pursuing outdoor adventures, he practices, you know, in his spare time, he practices law as a career partner. And he's also the past president of con Congregation Emmanuel and former director of the BC Water Polo Association. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Uh, thanks, folks. I'm going I'm to also kind of try to move through what I want to say uh, you know, quickly in the sense of, of concisely. Um, and, and just, you know, I'm also a board member of CNAC. And what I have heard from our practitioners on this call or this webinar is, in my view, the most important. Uh, and, and what I have heard again from you folks and have heard for the six years as a board member 
is what a wonderful community you have and the collaboration that you folks uh, emulate and what you do is phenomenal. So keep that up uh, and, and don't be shy about asking questions and getting the answers you may need to facilitate what you're doing because it's vital in my view to our society as a whole. Um, so there's a couple of things I just want to say off the top that I, that, I, that I heard and I want to make sure that I emphasize. There's two pieces of advice I want to give to each of you practitioners about your own businesses that I've heard. First of all, if you are not incorporated as a business, incorporate your business. That means going to a local solicitor and maybe an accountant and getting the right tax and legal advice to incorporate your business. Historically, what incorporations are is limited liability corporations, which means basically you are limiting your own liability as, an, as a shareholder to your investment in your business versus if you are a practitioner operating a proprietorship or a partnership, you are personally potentially can be sued for what happens. Now, as Michael and Tracy will say, you can be sued anyways, but this is an arrow in your quiver, so to speak, if something goes sideways that you can rely upon. So if there's one piece of advice I can give all of you right now, look into that. The second thing that, that Michael emphasized and Tracy emphasized was know your insurance and understand it. I am involved with a number of insurers across Canada. Uh, as you can imagine, I represent almost all of them. Um, and so we are seeing insurers respond as they must do to this pandemic. And some of the things we are seeing are, as Michael explained, some changes to policies which include exclusions. And if your general liability policy will include an exclusion for pandemic, you should know that. And you should make sure that you're aware of that and of course, deal with that appropriately. And my suggestion to you, like Michael said, is if that is part of your policy, you should look elsewhere uh, and, and let the market dictate, in my view, what insurers provide. And so that means calling your broker individually and making sure that broker can, can confirm for you what exactly is in your policy, particularly if you're renewing your policy. So right now you have policies in place which will include whatever exclusions were there, but upon renewal, those may change. So please uh, take the time to make sure you have that clarified. Uh, the next thing I wanna say is, is, is just basically what's been said a few times, and Laura said it this morning before we all got on this webinar, is it's hard to have expertise about how to reopen in a pandemic. There's no magic here. We're all trying our best to deal with the situation, both personally and globally. And again, what we're hearing from this group is best efforts, best practices to design for yourselves a standard to be applied across your community. And that's, in my view, as a lawyer, all that I can hope for right now. And as Tracy said, and Michael said, as long as you spend the time to do the research document your research, document your processes, ensure that you have explained those processes to all of your staff and have transparently provided those processes to all of the parents who might send their kids to your programs. You are doing, in my view, what you need to do. And that's something that I'll say is a theme for everything you do, but is particularly important right now because we are not gonna be able to eliminate the risk of COVID. There's no way to eliminate the risk. And there's no perfection standard for any of you. This is all about reducing or lowering risk. And when we talk about risk, we all know people have different risk tolerances. I have a pretty high risk tolerance. And as a lawyer, that becomes somewhat challenging sometimes, um, but also for some of my clients, they like it. Uh, so, so when it comes to, I think one of, the, one of the practitioners said, the parents didn't want to use masks. The parents didn't want to have the kids socially distanced. I 100% agree. 
but that's me as a parent, less so as a lawyer, okay? So there's a difference there. And I think the point that needs to be made is that if you're going to have these practices in place, in a place like Ontario that has a more stringent guidelines in place, or in British Columbia where, where guidelines are becoming more stringent as well, you need to make sure that you've carefully researched all the guidelines, made sure that you know your local guidelines versus the global uh, province-wide or country-wide guidelines. And as Jacqueline said, you know, Atlantic Bubble, you have more freedoms. This is the way it's going to work. BC right now, we're on the cusp of concern. I don't think, I'm not very concerned right now, I can tell you right now, but we're on the cusp of that. So you have to be really mindful almost day to day as to what's happening in your community and ensure that if the guidelines are changing, it's a moving target, folks, it's going to move throughout, that you respond appropriately. And I don't want this to be about the lawyers, okay, or liability. I, I want this to be about you folks doing what you can. So what I want to do really quickly is just kind of go through how a claim is, is, is constructed in negligence, just so you have this in your mind. There are three branches of a claim in negligence. First is duty of care. Duty of care is something established in common law and it's established by way of legislation. There are two duties of care that clearly exist here for you folks running programs. One is a duty of care towards the children in common law, which is a prudent parent standard. The second is a duty of care on the Occupier's Liability Act or common law regarding same, and Michael touched on this as well. And that's a duty to take care to ensure that the premises utilized, even outdoor premises, are reasonably safe. There is no particular law that says what all that means. Every case is fact specific. And what you folks are constructing is not a duty of care, it's in my view a standard of care. Because as a number of folks have said, there is no particular guideline out there for outdoor forest nature schools or outdoor programming generally. You're drawing upon the school guidelines. You're drawing upon the daycare guidelines. You're drawing upon common sense. And so when you have transparently set up your own procedures and your own policies, and you've done all of that, in my view, what you have set up is basically a standard of care. And what's important you do is not have an aspirational standard of care. Don't aspire to doing hand washing every 15 minutes, if that's what your standard is going to be. Do it. If you said something aspirational and you don't meet that aspirational standard, that can be problematic. So really be reasonable with yourselves about what you can achieve and cannot achieve. When it comes to being transparent with parents, be clear about what you're going to do and not going to do. So each parent can make their own risk assessment for themselves about what they want to do. And that applies across the board. You know, if you're having programming that you're going to have kids climbing rocks and you don't tell the parents you're going to climb rocks and a kid falls, that can be a problem. So think about that basic idea as it pertains to how you might deal with COVID. The other issue that I want to make sure you understand is the issue of causation. This is a little more academic, but let me put it to you as, as clearly as I can. A person who sues must be able to prove that a breach of standard of care actually caused the loss at issue. They have to link what they said you did wrong or didn't do with the actual situation that occurred. What I just wanted to kind of touch on is a, an issue I see with a lot of this concern about liability in the context of outdoor activities. How can someone prove that I got COVID from a tree, right, or a log? I don't, I don't see how they can. Now, saying that, the, the contact tracing in British Columbia has been phenomenal. And so they have basically informed us as citizens here 
that they can contact trace almost every infection they've located to a particular, I assume, location or set of persons. So there is certainly a possibility growing that a person could come to a program with COVID, no symptoms or whatever it's going to be, and because of being in contact with other people at some level, infect others. That, that certainly seems to be a potential risk. But proving what it is that caused that will be a real challenge. And so as a lawyer, as Michael and, and Tracy are saying, as long as you've documented all of this and you've done everything within the standard that you set for yourselves and within the guidelines that are out there for you to actually try to work with, I as defense counsel am appointed and I'm gonna be very assertive in the defense because I will be able to say, we have to be reasonable here about what we all experienced and how we all try to deal with this unprecedented time. So I'm gonna cut my comments off there. Oh, I'll say one more thing. Discussions we've had about memory and understanding and, and informed consent. I just wanna make sure I emphasize this. I have written informed consents. I wrote, I wrote them for municipalities across the board in British Columbia. I can tell you that there was some pushback. Some municipalities didn't want to use them at all. Some wanted to use them a lot. Some wanted waivers, some didn't. There's no magic here. But, it, but I do recommend for you folks that you do an informed consent that is separate and apart from your existing informed consent, a new one mm -hmm. that is specific to COVID-19. Take the time, put it together, borrow from your friends, borrow from CNAC, don't reinvent the wheel, but have it as a separate document so that if and when this ends, it goes away. And you don't confuse your existing documentation with this new issue. So I'll leave my comments there. And, and I think what's most important is practitioners collaborate and ask their questions. Thank you so much again. I think it really speaks to the collaborative approach and we've just got a comment on the chat about the diversity of panelists here today and I really think that that's been really important. I mean, I've certainly gotten a lot of information, a lot of reassuring information um, that what I did is best practice and that there are people, I'm not an insurance person, I'm not a lawyer, this kind of stuff keeps me up at night. Um, my job is to keep my kids and my staff safe. And so it's been really helpful to hear from the other side of things. And it's always really helpful because oftentimes I know when I was starting this journey, the lawyers and the insurance people were probably the scariest people I met in this journey, um, followed closely by government. Um, but it's nice to know that there are people that we can connect with that it that see the value in the work that we do and that there are workarounds and in like any risk mitigation that we do with our kids um, that we can find informed people to build on that risk mitigation and to support us in the work we do. Um, conscious of time, um, Pedra has asked that I extend the time, but I'm not sure how much time I have to answer questions. Um, so Petra, when you hear me calling out to you, um, if you could just text me the extension of time we have. Why don't we add, um, can you hear me? I sure can. <laughs> Why don't we <laughs> add 10 to 15 minutes and um, yeah, if like if panelists and, and attendees can stay on, great. And if not, we also understand. And as you've mentioned, we will be putting together a written summary from this talk and we will try to answer uh, any questions that don't get answered live right now in that written document. Perfect. So I will aim to shut her down around 2.15 Newfie time, whichever that is in the real world. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the question and answers. Um, I'm looking at some that have more of the upvotes. Um, some will be specific to your region. And so sometimes the, the question will be consult your own regional authorities or consult your own insurer. Um, because 
again, what works for me and what works for Monica might not work for somebody else. Um, we also have some questions around programming. Um, so maybe we'll start with that one. Um, I'm going to throw this out to the three practitioners. Um, what do, and I know Jacqueline, you spoke that you didn't necessarily enforce social distancing, um, but I'm wondering to the other panelists, what do the actual activities look like while you're maintaining physical distancing? And are there any resources that you relied on? Um, so Laura here, and I'll share that likewise, we did not uh, request that children maintain physical distance within their cohorts. Uh, this summer, the guidelines were specific about cohorts maintaining distance from one another, and um, that distance being two meters, and if, for instance, they were indoors, two different cohorts needed to be in a shared indoor space and not able to physically distance, they would have needed to wear masks. And uh, we ensured that the groups maintained physical distance, those cohorts remain, maintained physical distance so that uh, didn't come up, wasn't a need. And we relied, uh, and the guidelines supported us in relying on the screening and the small bubbles that were the cohort to lower risk through the summer program. We didn't intervene on children's play very much to ask them to maintain more space. And we structured the spaces they were in to be able to ma maintain more space as they played. Monica or Jackie, anything to add to that? I, I just want to second everything that Laura just said. Um, we tried to just build into our spaces and routines um, natural distancing measures, but did not enforce um, physical distancing. So we just tried to, we had three facilitators for 15 kids. So most of the time we were in groups of five with one facilitator out wherever in the woods with walkie talkies between um, facilitators that um, if a group was planning to be somewhere that was a smaller space, um, we would let the others know and that sort of thing. Um, but otherwise, like for school pretty much looked the same um, in terms of activities, um, that that didn't change. There were some loose parts that got put away um, and mostly just because we have an abundance of some things and we were trying to make our job um, easier. So some of our forest kitchen stuff was put away um, and some other loose parts just because they don't need to have it all out all the time to touch one thing one time and then not actually play with it. Um, so we did, we did a few things like that, but, but otherwise, yeah, we had, we had a bin on a table that was like things that need to be sanitized and, and otherwise the actual activities and programming didn't really look different. Um, I wanted to add that um, I added into the program a physical distancing uh, game, I'll call it. Um, as a facilitator, I've, um, I get to be creative with the way I communicate with kids. So it didn't feel like we were standing six feet apart. Um, but I did, uh, at the beginning of each week, um, I let them know that they, um, like, because these messages will be echoed throughout school, they're echoed. These messages are echoed at home. I just thought it was a great idea to echo these messages at Forest School. Um, so what we did, um, again, we had, um, you know, physical boundaries and that kind of thing. But I let the the children's play a game where um, we we weren't we weren't allowed to touch fingertips. So if their arms were spread out, um, they weren't allowed to touch fingertips. And they were, you know, getting used to that spatial awareness. So I think, as much as uh, we didn't enforce social distancing. Um, like is required in other parts of the world. Um, I do think um, Educating our children um, on what um, they need to be aware of like within regards of other people just so that you know forest school is a wonderful place to learn and is a place we can interact um but this is our new normal so um supporting parents in that um that education you know i didn't want them going home saying well forest school said we could do this mm -hmm. i didn't <laughs> you know we are still spacing it out and not to um 
you know, leave that responsibility all on the children, but just uh, they can make informed decisions as well to protect themselves in the same way that they would cough in their um, elbow or, you know, that kind of thing. So just to add, um, yeah, thanks. Um, we're getting a lot of questions too on the creative creativity kits, the bubble bags. I forget what uh, Ottawa Forest and Nature School called them. Um, I know from our experience, our bubble bags are packed by the kids on Monday morning. So they arrive, we're doing week long camps right now. They arrive, they select what they think they're going to need for the week. They can add to it really useful for things like that water bottle that gets left in the woods that's all been licked and rubbed all over um, that can go in the bubble bag and we can sanitize our hands so we're we know that we're limiting um, contamination uh, just wondering a couple questions on the question and answer to the practitioners um, what kind of materials are you finding you're using not using has it shifted I know for us we actually bring a lot less out and it's actually been really good for us to practice like reducing our reliance on even pivots and materials and really getting back to the the purpose of the program um wondering if you guys care to speak on anything that you've noticed changing or or how you're bringing it out what are you cleaning when do you feel that you need to clean it that kind of thing Um, we, we also have been finding we're using uh, so, a lot. Of <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> um, and, and even like we have a lot of loose parts in our clearing in the area that we tend to gather the most <clears throat> that are wood cookies and sticks and different things like that that have already been collected and kind of set aside. And I think they were touched once this entire summer program. Um, and I think that's mostly because this time of year, there is a lot of things to be found and played with out in nature, whereas in winter, um, those natural loose parts that you find in the woods can be a little bit more sparse. Um, but we definitely found like bug jars, magnifying glasses, binoculars, um, those we ended up buying more of than we originally had. Um, we also doubled the size of our program. So we had more kids trying to share them and less sharing wanting to be happen <laughs> to, to be happening. Um, so like, and just trying to keep, yeah, trying to keep things simple, keep things small, things that kids could throw in their backpack or throw in their pocket. Um, so that they don't need to like ask someone else to hold it or that sort of thing. And then, like I said earlier, we had a, a, a bin on a table um, that uh, actually was underneath the hand washing station of things that needed to be sterilized at the end of the day if it needed to be. So at uh, the Ottawa Forest and Nature School, we, we, as I mentioned, we had to work pretty hard to try and understand uh, how our materials related to the guidelines that were available. So for instance, um, when toys uh, were spoken about in the guidelines, we considered what they might have meant by toys uh, and took that to mean probably we're talking about plastic and, and metal, so uh, non-porous materials. And so those were pulled from program. We didn't have very much plastic to begin with. and um, but pots and pans were pulled from program initially, and we um, generally had a much more sparse kit that relied uh, uh, on their on wooden materials that were already out and on the land, yeah. and the loose parts already out there. And uh, um, ropes and swings were part of our kits, and arts and crafts materials were too, and they were easier to um, sanitize at the end of the day. Some educators wanted to return the uh, mud kitchen to their kits or at least a small portion and offered to wash them with soap and water and sanitize them at the end of every day, which was exactly what we needed to do and felt like a fit. Uh, we definitely worked with less than we had in the past. And, um, and like Monica, she mentioned magnifying glasses, binoculars, those are easy to give a spray to at the end of every day and we laid them out on a tarp. We definitely had concerns about the fact that we were running a less environmentally friendly program than we have in previous years. For instance, we're using paper towels instead of sharing hand mm -hmm. towels and we are using a disinfectant spray outside and on the land and leaving a tarp and materials, plastics or, or metals outside on the land drying. Um, 
absolutely not as kind to the land as we have been in the past and a necessity this past summer. Mm -hmm. It's all about that risk benefit, right? Like what is, what is worse? What is better? And it's a dance. I, I share your pain. The day that we went out to Costco and bought rolls and rolls of paper towel was like soul crushing to me. Um, but to me, the risk mitigation of having paper towels that we can, you know, that have to go in the landfill to me was, at least optically kind of like this is where we need to be right now and 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 once we get an idea of everything else we can we can reestablish. but right now it was about the safety and the of the kids in the program health it, canada it, i was just gonna say that health canada has a pretty um intense list of um approved disinfectant sprays and there are quite a few on the list that are um, at least at the more eco-friendly end of the spectrum so I definitely poured over that list for a very long time and found like was looking at ingredients lists and, and found one that I could at least feel somewhat okay with using um, even just knowing that we're using it where kids are touching things yeah. um, so the, the less chemicals the better um, but there is like Health Canada does have a list out there of what is technically approved in fighting COVID or killing COVID germs or is effective um, with things at both ends of the, the yeah. spectrum there. I, ha I make the joke with parents all the time that I can't sanitize trees. Um, and we laugh about it um, because it's the truth. And I won't be sanitizing trees. Um, I do sanitize them my kitchen um, stuff that we're touching and we're, you know, sharing. Um, and I've been able to, you know, share those materials more given the provincial situation. Um, what I've found though, uh, I am a fairly new program. So we've been running now for three years and growing all the time. Um, where I thought we would be in a place where we would be adding materials to the forest, uh, where I didn't feel that need, um, the children have picked up more loose parts than ever. So they've created their own. Um, we've been using the resources available to us in the forest. So I don't have, I love the idea of the um, bubble bags that were that are being talked about and I might consider that for the future um, but really for extra supplies aside from the tarps that I set up uh, which children don't use um, I mean they use them underneath them but I set them up the children don't set them up um, there's no plastic down there there's just natural materials and in fact I just wanted to mention that it enriched our program having mm -hmm a lack of those plasticky or papery things, just a forest uh, setting um, has provided a really beautiful environment. So um, I guess my stance on the extra sanitizing things is that you're not reducing the quality of your program. In fact, I think you're enriching it um, by allowing children to connect with nature just a little more. Yeah, we noticed the same thing too, for sure, that it it, it shifted the program and it, be, it really did become this kind of what we'd always thought it would be. But then we always were like, but they need markers for some reason. And it turns out they didn't need markers at all. We needed markers. Um, so it's, it's good to hear that that's kind of how, how everything's um, moving on. Um, I did, this might be a question for uh, CNAC, even Steph or Petra, um, we're getting a lot, and maybe this is a question that we come back to afterwards. We're getting a lot of questions about sharing um, COVID documents. Um, for those of us that have already started and deep dived, I know that we've partnered to create our waivers and our registration forms and our screening processes. Um, and we're getting a lot of requests for provincial cohorts to see if we can start getting some regional guidance on that. So maybe what I'll do for that question is I'll just throw it back to Petra and staff and the crew there and we can kind of sit down and see. It sounds like the Atlantic bubble um, can can work on some stuff and, and maybe we'll see. So I'll leave that question unanswered for now um, with the hope that we can get back to it. Um, there was a question right at the beginning. Sorry, I'm trying to multitask here. 
Um, we had a question about how closely people work with uh, public health and local health departments. Um, and the question specifically says, do you go to them or do you wait for them to come to you? My guidance would be go to them. Um, and maybe the insurance and the lawyer can back me up on this. Um, but I truly believe, and again, because everything is regional, because everything is circumstantial, because you need to know your site, you need to know your room, you need to know your space, you need to know your staff, that I would not wait for public health to come to me. And I know that in Newfoundland, they are working on daycares and schools and restaurants and all of these things and they might not even know that I exist. So I made a really great relationship with Tina down at Public Health and I would email her daily um, to say, well, what about this? What about this? And she was really great at getting back to me. Um, maybe the insurance and the, the legal people want to weigh on this, but that would be my, my thoughts on that. Laura, can I jump in? Yes, please. So what Laura is doing there is creating a record. So basically what she's done is she's asked the questions, she's gotten advice, and she now has it in a written record. So if and when something goes sideways and if and when someone tries to sue, which I'm hoping never happens, Laura, um, <laughs> she'll have that written record. And so that's, that's exactly what I recommend folks do. Be inquisitive, uh, try to involve health officials in your quest for answers. Uh, and then essentially ensure you do what you think you can do in the circumstances. I totally want to echo what Aaron just said. And by being that proactive, it makes it tougher for someone to say that you're negligent. The more you go above and beyond what is actually required of the reasonable person, the better off you're going to be when you have the defense. So that even if someone does choose to sue, and I hope like Aaron does that no one does, you have a good defense that your insurance company will pay for to make sure that your program keeps running smoothly. I think that's an excellent point. Thank you, Laura. But let me just add one more thing. If, if in doing that, the health official says you must do X, Y, and Z, or if there's a health order that says you must ha have masks or you must, you know, uh, physical distance, that's just the breaks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. And you, you cannot wiggle out of those there was a question about essentially whether we can have parents waive these rights. And the answer is no. Yeah. Parents can't waive their children's rights. Yeah. They can make an informed decision about what they want to do for themselves and their children. But as Michael pointed out, I think Tracy did as well, a child can sue you two years after the age of 19 in most provinces. So that's why you have to keep these records forever. And that's why you can't waive the children's rights to the parents. So what I'm hearing is that I'm unreasonable and I need more office space for storage. <laughs> Thank you guys um, for that. Um, it does feel good to know that I'm on the right track for um, protecting myself. I will add too, um, in our circumstance, because we reached out so much, we're actually getting um, more understanding of our program. Um, when we started a few years ago, it was like, I want to do this, um, please insure me, or I want to do this, please license me. And it was, it was kind of, we hit a lot of brick walls. Um, but as we're persisting and as we're saying, well, I want to do this, what about this, what about this, what about this? Well, now people are going, oh yeah, I heard about Cloudberry. They're the ones that like, they they know what they're doing they're asking the right questions so the people that maybe were giving us brick walls a couple of years ago are now we've been kind of poking at them enough that they're like oh no they do they do know what they're talking about or they do understand some of the risk or the liability that they're putting in their program and we're getting more of a collaborative relationship with those that we've been working with for sure um I want to see, we probably have time for one more question. Um, when do you require masks to be worn? I think Erin answered that when public health says you have to. Um, other than that, what we've said is that we will welcome masks. Public health doesn't determine that we have to. And I have that in writing in an email. Um, but what we've said is people are welcome to wear masks. Staff will always be welcome to wear masks at their comfort level except when public health says you have to, in which case, sorry guys, 
we're going to have to put on masks. So that I think would be where we stand on that. Um, there's a lot of talk about the risk benefit assessment toolkit. So I'll speak briefly to that. And then I think we'll wrap it up and answer all the questions in um, PDF or on digital form. The risk benefit assessment toolkit is available at outdoorplaycanada.ca. And maybe Steph, I think you've shared that on the chat, but it wouldn't hurt to share it again if it's got lost. Um, that is an excellent document. It doesn't, I don't believe, have COVID-related policies at the moment because it was produced last September when there was no such thing. Um, but it certainly does really, I use it all the time as a guiding document. It's really well thought out. Um, it's got informed consent information. It's got your risk benefit assessment toolkits. That's what we've relied on to develop our programming this summer, again, in consultation with other people in COVID related stuff. But I do really recommend if you're looking at more general programming that you check out Outdoor Play Canada and their risk benefit toolkit. And I will open up the floor if anybody has any last thoughts before we go or if Steph or Petra want to weigh in on anything before we go all right sounds like you're all off the hook nothing from our end over here Laura uh, we'll work on putting together that document and we'll share it with all the folks who've registered for the webinar perfect Thanks, Well, have a great day, everybody. <laughs>yeah, for sure. Just, I'm just working on saving the Q&A and then I'm going to end it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no worries. I was like, oh, what part do I, am I allowed to leave? Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to jump off too. Okay. Awesome. Bye guys. Bye Laura. Bye everybody.